views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Nice to see you. Happy holidays. The holidays are upon us. And um, we're going to do what we always do, and that is talk to writers and editors and journalists and sometimes filmmakers, which we're going to do today, and uh, also um, uh, photographers, anybody who's putting stuff out in the Bronx. And uh, this evening, I'm thrilled because uh, uh, we are uh, going to be joined by somebody who really writes for two papers. She works for AM New York and also uh, for of the Bronx Times. It is Alejandra O'Connell Domenech, and uh, nice to have you with us again, Alejandra. Nice to see you. Nice to see you again. And happy holidays to you, and of course to all our viewers in the, in the borough of the Bronx. Um, Alejandra, just a little background. I mean, you were on with us uh, early in the fall. Um, talk a little bit about um, what, what you do for AM New York and the Bronx Times. Uh, you were telling us before the show that the uh, staffs have shrunk, and so you got different um, uh, you know, responsibilities, just so people can know what it is you normally cover. Um, sure. So I'm pretty much just a general assignment reporter at AM New York, um, which is owned by Schneps Media. And Schneps Media also owns the Bronx Times, along with the Queen's Courier and now um, the Brooklyn paper. And so they, um, a lot of what we will write about in AM will be picked up by other papers that are owned by Schneps. Um, do you have a uh, preference? I mean, we were talking earlier about, um, you know, the different things that you might cover uh, in the city. Do you have a preference? And it sounded like uh, you really like doing education stories. Yeah, but um, before the pandemic reached the city, I was doing predominantly education reporting, which um, I love very much. And, um, you know, at, during March, um, the decision was made to kind of make me more general assignment because there was just so much, so much happening. And I had to cover, you know, what the mayor's press conferences, what he was up to, COVID, COVID was, everyone became, you know, an expert basically on COVID, um, but I still like to, um, to try to focus a lot on, on education and make sure that we, we cover as much as um, we can when it comes to schools. Especially now, and I was going to say, well, you know, but the schools are closed, so what's to cover? But of course, there's uh, so much more uh, to cover. So now let's just get it right. The um, infection rate was at 3%, and that uh, for the governor and the mayor was a magic number. And so when it hit 3%, it was like, boom, schools are gonna close. There's been some controversy about that, about you know where was the number exactly? And then of course, so, uh, you know, they, they did end up closing the schools and putting everybody on remote. Why don't we start there? What is that about? Do you wanna say, did they do the right thing? I mean, where, how do you view what happened with the closing of schools? Then we'll talk about where we're at. Um, sure. So yeah, about, you know, seven days ago, roughly sometime last week, um, the city's COVID-19 positivity rate based on a seven day rolling average um, reached 3% here based off of the city's data. And that uh, once, once the city reaches that number, that was kind of a signal to then shut down all public schools. And that was a part of um, the mayor's and the union's um, agreement in that they outlined in their school reopening plan, um, you know, earlier in the in the fall that then they had to submit to the state for approval. Um, that's a pretty low threshold to have for closing schools. Like the state's threshold um, is a, at least a few percentage points um, higher. I'm sorry that I'm kind of blanking. I think it's believe it's between five to 9% that that's what that threshold is. But um, the mayor has said repeatedly that, um, that that low number was set in order to assure parents um, that, that the city was really taking health and safety very seriously when it came to reopening schools. And so that's why there, there were days where, you know, reporters and parents and city officials alike kept waiting for, um, that magical number of three to finally uh, to pop up. 
there are so many, like the domino effect, there are so many other things that happen if you say we close the schools. Number one, it impacts the subways in, in both ways. Yes, people have fewer people on the subways and buses, which right now is a very good thing, but the MTA is starving for money. And so, you know, having teachers and, you know, administrators and everybody on, on the trains, that's a good thing. It puts parents in just an absolutely untenable, I can't even imagine that, Happily, my, my children are older now and they're not in the public schools. I don't know what we would have done if uh, the kids had to be home and then getting them in front of a computer. I mean, and the, and the whole technology thing. I mean, so there's a lot of things that have to happen. It's very easy to say we want to be safe. On the other hand, I see a number of uh, editorials and others who say, you know what, shut it down now, because if you don't do it now, it's going to get worse and worse. Um, so so I, I just have tremendous sympathy for uh, parents and others who are like, what, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to manage this? Yeah, it's been um, a pretty tough year for parents, <laughs> um, to say the least. I mean, the understatement of the year. Yeah. Just before Thanksgiving. Uh, really. Yeah, no, but, exactly. And I mean, they they had to go through a shutdown in the spring and then suddenly trying to, you know, navigate remote learning. And, you know, there were, you know, plenty of students that were just unable to attend classes because either they lived in like temporary housing that had shoddy Wi-Fi service and they couldn't access remote classes yes. or um, they, you know, live in underconnected communities that and, um, you know, it, and so Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi connection and uh, computer well, access is very uh, limited. Let me just interrupt you. There, there's no guarantees. I mean, that's that's what the issue is. What I want to ask, um, the Catholic schools stayed open. And I will ask you, you know, how do you measure that? I know what I think the, the reason is, but, uh, you know, the public schools are closed, but the Catholic schools made it clear that they're going to stay open. What are your thoughts? Well, I think that um, something that's kind of surprised everyone this fall is that there's been a relatively low positivity, COVID positivity rate within schools. Um, so schools really haven't proven to be like these super spreader sites that people kind of feared they would be when, um, you know, officials were considering reopening them uh, for in-person learning. And I know that at Catholic schools, they have been abiding by very um, strict standards of, of cleanliness and um, they really did not <laughs> want to be subject to any more closures and really wanted to push for in-person classes. Um, a, a lot because they obviously because they feel that in-person classes are are better but also due to financial reasons there was a real um fear that if if catholic school students wouldn't be able to return to classes in person that then parents would pull them out entirely and that would um shutter more schools and the the and catholic schools have been um in trouble for a while now I, I am going to throw in one other thing, um, which is a clear difference, is uh, resources. Pre uh, President-elect Biden talked about, you know, keeping schools open through this process. He, did, he said, I think we can do it, but then you need money for infrastructure, for ventilators and space and other things. And I, I'm, I'm suggesting that, that maybe the Catholic schools have a little more wherewithal, a little more maneuverability than the public schools, not to say that everything is perfect. But also what you raised is a very interesting point about the, the um, uh, you know, if parents start pulling out, I'm paying for this and they can't keep them open, you know, all that kind of thing. I think that that uh, comes comes up. Now, with the prospects of reopening, if you're looking for the numbers to get below 3%, and uh, what you say is true, it is lower uh, in, in New York than in other states and other uh, municipalities, that's true. But if, if um, the, the way things go, I can't see them reopening, you know, in the near future. We're going to get through this winter. It's predicted to be very difficult as far as COVID. Um, but then one of the things they've established is everybody's going to need to be tested before they get back. What do we got? A million school kids and how many teachers? <laughs> you know, it's like my reaction is I'd love it, but good luck with that. Yeah, um, there are still a lot of unanswered questions when it comes to, you know, round two of school reopening. There's, you know, when schools closed, that meant that roughly 300,000 students that were taking part in in-person learning suddenly, you know, had to shift to remote learning. So we have at least that number that is interested um, in going back to schools. And 
you know, the Department of Education had that one week opt-in period and they said that um, enrollment for opt-in increased by roughly 30,000, but, um, but yeah, but any, so yeah, there's a lot of kids out there that, um, and a lot of families that are really depending and want their children to return back to schools, but, um, and so they're, they're really waiting for answers and the city has just taken a really long time um, to give any. What we know now is that it will be a phased in approach, um, starting with so, district 75 students or confusion for parents <laughs> yeah My well it'll be it'll be similar parents. yeah yeah exactly it'll be similar to um when schools reopened in September when you know you know the, the uh the city's youngest learners will be probably the first it'll be district 75 students and then the city's youngest learners will then go back in followed by elementary school students followed by middle school students and no student that um, that doesn't have like a parental like COVID test uh, testing consent form um, will be able to re-enter schools. So uh, I, I want to conclude. We got about a minute left. I want to conclude uh, with this, I, and it's almost like a little editorial comment. Um, I, I think that um, some of this is going to begin to do or uh, usher in some new ways of looking at things. They canceled the regions. Uh, exams and um, other testings are certainly on hold. I mean, the whole thing is kind of jumbled up. I wonder if this is going to be a message to everybody. You know what? Maybe we don't need all that testing anyway. Maybe we can take another look. That's my own editorial opinion. I hope that's true. Um, your thoughts? Do you think? Do you think that there will be some innovations in education as a result of this? Um, I think so. I think that this is um, a really challenging time that's forcing people to kind of really um, face some longstanding issues within schooling here in the city, and um, they're going to have to address address these problems and address testing and and roll out some changes like like they have been. I don't think anything is really going to be the same back when, even when the vaccine is yeah, and, um, distributed. And certainly a new look at health in the schools, at, at cleanliness in the schools, which, you know, we're going through such a terrible time, but maybe uh, positive things on the way. Let's let's look at it that way. Anyway, um, uh, Alejandro O'Connell uh, Domenech, uh, thank you so much. Have a happy holiday. Enjoy uh, uh, as much as you can distanced with your families or however you choose to celebrate, but uh, we wish you the best and we will all keep reading uh, what you uh, report on AM New York and uh, the Bronx Times. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. It's great. Okay, we're gonna take a, a short break and uh, then when we come back, uh, we'll change gears and we're gonna talk about uh, the Mott Haven Film Festival, which has a special event coming up. Films in the Bronx, coming up next, don't go away.
we know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, and they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. There's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the State Health Department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people. It's going to go way further than we actually can understand. Dan. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality. Okay, back with you on uh, the Bronx Buzz. And uh, we're going to, as I said earlier, we're going to shift gears. And we're going to go from a uh, very important talk about schools to uh, my good buddy, Ninoska, who is uh, the uh, the creator, the founder of the Mott Haven Film Festival. So nice to have you with us once again. Ninoska, how are you today? Oh, thank you for having me. I'm doing well. How are you? We're doing well, and we're looking forward to uh, the holidays. I know um, uh, you have a daughter. And I'm sure she's excited. She may make some noise today. So. Uh, yeah, she, she's making noise right now. Maybe you guys don't hear it, though. <laughs> Let's talk about the Mount Haven Film Festival. Um, when did you uh, create the thing? Why did you create the thing? And then we'll talk about what's really exciting and that's coming up, uh, you know, just in a week or two. Yes, so um, in the summer of 2019, my sister's film, Sexy Tortillas, was accepted and was going to be screened at the uh, Ladies Film Festival at, in LA. I believe that's the, the title. And um, we're on the plane midair. I just so happened to stop our conversation, which I don't remember what it was about. And we, um, and I asked her, is there a film festival in the Bronx? Her response was, I don't know. And then I said, we need to change that. And that's how I came up with the idea of the My Haven Film Festival. I felt that, um, the community needed something. The community is changing right now and it needed something um, that was positive. And, and I felt that the film festival itself was going to be great. And so the idea is you run one a year, one festival a year, or do you do them often? And of course, 2020 is nothing to measure against because you know, <laughs> who knows what we're doing, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, what, what, what is the general plan for the film festival itself? So the film festivals usually go once a year. They usually partake once a year because um, there's a process that you have to um, basically like advertise that you're accepting films and then you have to accept the films and then you have to review the films and then you have to pick the best of those films and then you have to put it all together and create the film festival. So there is a process and um, usually it's a, a with everything included, it takes a, a few months, which is why most of the film festivals take um, take a year to come back and, and redo it again. How did you learn how to do this? I mean, in other words, if I was sitting with my sister on a plane and said, I think I'll make a film festival, I would have to figure <laughs> out how to do it. Do you have a background in film or is it something that you've just kind of taken a, a liking to and, and have developed, you know, even the, the guidelines that you just outlined for us just now? Um, because my sister's the filmmaker of the family, we, um, I, I have that experience when it comes to, uh, the whole film festival industry. Um, uh, like I've, I've been, um, a producer for her in a sense, I've been her moral support in other ways. And, um, you know, I've experienced the whole transition of her being a regular college student into becoming a film student and eventually becoming a a professional filmmaker but um but i i've been there with her when she's like saying oh um i need to hurry up and finish my sounds because i need to submit my film to this particular film festival so that part i was very familiar with uh, my background is um in pr and communications and at one point i even had an event planning company 
So for me, the way I saw the film festival was as, was as if I was planning a party, right? Like I, I've done weddings, I've done many baby showers. So, so for me, it was more like, yeah, this fit right into right the, exactly the, the background exactly adding in what your understanding of uh, films uh, is. Now, this film that that your your sister created that has done very well um, filmed in Mexico. I, I mean, yes, I understand that it was filmed it, in Guanajuato. Yes, this is one of the films that's going to be seen at the Mott Haven Film Festival. Now, yes. now let's go. The film festival is coming up. It's coming up in December. People are looking for things to do. Um, so let's talk about it. And then also I want to, you know, I don't encourage people to go out unless it's going to be safe. And you insisted that it will. So let's talk about yes. when and where and how we're going to be part. Of it. So, it. yeah. So the venue is on 140th Street and Alexander Avenue. It's Bronx at Art the Space. Bronx Art Space. I love the Bronx Art Space. Who does? Yes. Bronx Art Space. I was very fortunate to um, bump into them and, and ask them and they said yes. So, um, of course, it's very limited seating. And uh, we also have a virtual option because, of course, we know everything that's going on with COVID. Um, the seats will be uh, six feet apart. We are requesting everyone to wear masks. Uh, we are providing um, um, hand sanitizers and we will be take, you know, taking temperatures and all of that. So we're definitely following all of the CDC guidelines. And then in order to participate virtually, there, there's a link we can have uh, our producer Rebecca can put that link up on the screen. Yes, of course. It's and basically uh, mahavenfilmfestival.eventbrite.com. Mahavenfilmfestival.eventbrite.com. Yes. How many films are going to be screened? So we have a total of 32 films. Bye. Thank yeah, you. I, 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 listen, people in the Bronx, we're, we're creative. We're doing our thing. I love it. 32 films. Yes, 32 films by 32 independent filmmakers. And, when, and the films range between a minute and 30 minutes. Okay. And when can, when can we go? When can we see it? How does it work? So the film festival is between the start, opening night is December 11th. And it goes all the way until December 13th. So it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, like I said, if you go to the link that's going to be provided, um, you have the options of virtual or in person. Uh, listen, I am, as you know, it's totally enthusiastic about, about you and about your work and about the film festival. There are so many people making films in the Bronx. You, you, I'm, let's, break, let's break all rules here. You could bring her on. She, she want to come on TV? <laughs> you want to say hello? Yeah, she, come on. Here we go. Hi. And what's her name? April. Hello. April, nice to see you, April. Are you going to uh, enter, are you going to uh, participate in the film festival with us this year? Um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> this is the day I guess that uh, she's going to be with um, her nana. <laughs> well, she's, clearly, she's Auntie's bestie forever. Mommy, uh, mommy. Yes, yes, right. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Ninoska, um, so after you get through this film festival, and I know it's a big thing and you want it to go well, we all want it to go well, what, what's going to be the next plan? Then you're going to start taking in more, um, uh, you know, more more films, that kind of thing? Of course. Um, by 2021, by May 2021, we will reopen the submissions for the 2021 season. Um, the cycle will begin all over again. Uh, for this one, I would love to see a music video. That was one of the things I was pushing for since the Bronx is the home of hip hop. <laughs> but um, I didn't get that this year. I did get some anime though. That was fun. Um, and we also, I also want more international films. We did get three of them this year, which was pretty cool. And I also want more student films. And uh, we did get some of those. You, you could go through all the categories and I'm going to yes. say we want more and more. We love what you're doing. The Mott Haven Film Festival, uh, again, to check out, to get tickets, to participate, to see all the mm -hmm. information. Uh, repeat again the, um, uh, the, the URL so people can find Yes, of course. So visit www.mothavenfilmfestival.eventbrite.com for your tickets. Like Ladies and gentlemen, the great Ninoska, along with April, uh, and uh, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Happy holiday to you. Stay safe. Uh, and, and, and we can still enjoy and we'll still be together in our own ways. Uh, and uh, we want to wish all our, uh, uh, our viewers and everybody in the borough of the Bronx uh, happy holidays. 
uh, certainly to our great producer, uh, Rebecca, and uh, our production assistant, Sienna. Thank you to them for all the great work they do with us all year. And guess what? We'll be back next week. We're not going yes. to there. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Ninoski, you be well and, and good luck. And I'm going to try to either do it virtually or get out there uh, uh, over to uh, uh, the Bronx Art Space for the film festival. The of course. Of December. December 11th through the 13th. Well, that does it for the Bronx Buzz. Uh, for, I almost said for this year, but no, New Year's is coming up later. Uh, everybody have a happy Thanksgiving, people of the Bronx. And uh, really, uh, best wishes to our great producer, Rebecca. Our uh, production assistant is Sienna. And uh, thank you again to Nanoska for uh, joining us. Everybody stay safe. Enjoy the holidays. Listen, make a couple of sacrifices and we'll all be together. We'll be able to do Christmas and Hanukkah and Kwanzaa and then New Year's. And we'll all be much healthier if we uh, kind of do this right. So uh, happy holidays. All the best. We'll see you next week. Good night.